We need on-site renewable energy, high efficiency, and all-electric homes everywhere in order to have a safe, just transition. There are going to be incredible opportunities for workers in this new energy economy. That environmental justice is also about communities being able to take charge of their own infrastructure. The topic of workforce development is near and dear to our hearts at MREA. We started providing training in solar PV, solar thermal, small wind energy, and energy efficiency in 1990. We were one of the first accredited solar training programs in the country and still maintain accreditation with the Interstate Renewable Energy Council to this day. For over 30 years, we've committed ourselves to offering the most accessible, affordable, and market-relevant solar training and today, more than 600 individuals a year utilize our training to get a foothold in the industry, earn certification, and sharpen their skills. At the MREA, we benefited from an experienced, dedicated, generous, and growing group of industry professionals that have taught with us, sharing their real-world knowledge and experience with aspiring professionals. And in turn, we've shared our training resources with technical and community colleges throughout the Midwest recognizing that clean energy and energy efficiency training should be available to interested students everywhere. We've also benefited from the support of the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office, which has helped us to provide instructor training, curriculum resources, and student work experience to more than 200 instructors from nearly 100 Midwest training organizations over the last 10 years. 2011, when we started our first instructor training program, the market was much different than today. Solar employment demand was pretty much only a reality in California and Hawaii, with other states just starting to shine. The national electrician shortage was forecast, but seemed a distant and avoidable problem. Utility companies were opposed to solar projects, even large-scale facilities, indicating that the technology would never be ready for prime time. One group that fully recognized the transformative potential of solar energy was the U.S. Department of Energy, which launched the SunShot Initiative with the goal of reducing the cost of solar energy by 75% and making it the cheapest source of electricity in the U.S. This goal, I should note, was met with much skepticism at the time. After the mortgage default crisis weakened the U.S. banking system and caused economic turmoil at the end of the George W. Bush administration in 2009, the Obama administration passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act as their first major initiative to support economic recovery. The act invested the federal funds that made the SunShot initiative possible. Today, we know that the cost declines envisioned by SunShot were achieved earlier and more steeply than anyone expected. Those of us close to the work know that the market developed unevenly across the country. Through much of the SunShot years, the promise of clean energy employment in the Midwest turned out to be more smoke than fire. When coupled with the solar coaster effects of looming federal tax credit sunsets, ups and downs in state incentives, and the patchwork nature of utility territories and their divergent interests, the last decade has seen false starts in solar training programs in Midwest states, booms and busts in solar efficiency and weatherization employment, and some skepticism about the scale and durability of a quote-unquote green economy. With the last five years of solar and wind as the leading sources of new energy capacity additions in the U.S., the promise started to become reality. And now with a massive federal energy infrastructure investment that locks in a decade of tax policy certainty, the market is fundamentally changed from a decade ago and the doubts about employment needs have been erased. The national electrician shortage is real, present and growing, not to mention shortfalls in other related trades. Utilities are prioritizing solar and wind as preferred capacity additions. Consumer demand for distributed energy resources is high and growing. And with a trend toward electrification, we are set to dramatically increase electricity infrastructure needs. The Inflation Reduction Act not only established a decade of policy certainty, but also has provisions that drive projects and employment opportunities in areas with high unemployment while incentivizing apprenticeships and prevailing wage. In states like Illinois and Minnesota, federal and state policies are already set to work together to increase the investment impact 
while other states are currently planning how to best to leverage the federal investment. From rooftop solar and home electrification to large-scale solar and wind facilities, the breadth and depth of workforce demand will require a full force training effort from technical and community colleges, apprenticeship training programs, independent training programs like ours at the MREA, and the myriad organizations and agencies that provide career support services. Today, we can confidently say that there has never been more employment opportunity for skilled workers, young and old. To explore the needs, opportunities, and challenges to meet the workforce needs of the energy transition, we talk with Richard Lawrence, Program Director with the Interstate Renewable Energy Council. Support growth in the clean energy industry by attending the 2023 Energy Fair, June 23rd through the 25th in Custer, Wisconsin. Join us Friday and Saturday from 5 to 7 p.m. for the MREA's Clean Energy Career Fair and take advantage of networking and educational opportunities. Make your plans and learn more at theenergyfair.org. Well, we are joined today by Richard Lawrence, who is Program Director of the Interstate Renewable Energy Council. Richard, you have been leading the National Solar Jobs Accelerator, funded by the U.S. Department of Energy that connects military vets and transitioning service members with training certifications and apprenticeships in solar. You also support SolSmart program, which helps local jurisdictions scale up solar markets. You've worked on the Solar App Project, which is automated permitting. You co-chair the Solar Energy Industry Association's Quality Assurance Working Group, and you've worked at a variety of technical and community colleges as part of solar and energy efficiency training. And we're here today to talk about clean energy and solar workforce needs. How's it going today? Doing well. Thank you for having me. You know, this is our bread and butter too. We do a lot of training at the MREA. And so this is a topic that really concerns us. So maybe just to get us started, can you just kind of give us a general projection of where the U.S. solar market is going and the scale of the workforce need in the coming years? Solar market right now is grown significantly over the last decade. But as we look at the next decade, especially if we look at the workforce needed, today we're at you know, roughly a quarter of a million jobs in the uh, solar industry specifically. To meet the goals of the federal government, the various state governments out there, the Inflation Reduction Act goals, et cetera, to meet those goals to be producing 30% of the nation's electricity from solar, we're looking at uh, nearly quadrupling the workforce in the next decade. So going from 250,000 to, to close to a million jobs just in the solar uh, industry alone. Yeah, that's kind of staggering growth and just kind of building off of that last point you made. That's just in the solar industry alone. That's even not even like the broader electrification And so maybe to set that up, what impact, you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, what impact are we expecting that to have on workforce needs? The Inflation Reduction Act is the largest climate action bill that's been uh, introduced in the United States. It has provisions all across the clean energy industry. When you look at the entire bill, the projections funded by the the Blue Green Alliance study done by the University of Massachusetts looks at an increase of 9 million jobs across the clean energy sector just as a result of this act alone. Uh, that's an increase above uh, the business as usual. And again, if you look at the solar side of that, you're looking at 700, 800,000 plus jobs just in the solar industry, primarily as a result of that act. That's really interesting to think about this 30% of U.S. electricity generation coming from solar and that only being like one-ninth of the amount of job growth projected in the by the IRA. So maybe, maybe you can help us dig into some of the key provisions in the IRA and any other federal bill that you think will define some of the, the workforce need. The Inflation Reduction Act is, is, is very comprehensive in terms of the technologies that it's looking at all across the board of different clean energy technologies from residential energy efficiency and electrification, you know, your basic air sealing, weatherization, all the way up through new technologies of, of hydrogen and, you know, new vehicle, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, uh, but also power plants and carbon sequestration 
it really is, it goes across the board. So uh, what it does it extends a lot of the existing tax credits or that ones that had um, been on a, on a pathway to expire. The investment tax credit is the one mostly used by solar. Uh, the production tax credit has been primarily a, a wind industry driver. Those, both of those tax credits are being extended for you know 10 years and where they were set to expire. Uh, historically, those tax credits also have been on a short-term basis, so often renewed for only one or two years at a time, sometimes half of that being retroactive, uh, having the time already expired. And, and with this, they are looking at, you know, a 10 year uh, plus time frame. And so that's critically important as well as you look at some of these larger projects that can take three, four, five years to get a permit, you know, get all the engineering design, all of that and get the permits. Interconnection queues you're seeing as challenge as well, sometimes taking multiple years there. So the long-term time frame is really important. The other aspect that the Inflation Reduction Act looks at is the whole supply chain as well. The production credit can be used to produce components, the solar panels, the, the wind turbine components, those other components. They can get a production credit for uh, the production of those from a manufacturing facility. Even before that, there's credits to, to build. They can get the investment tax credit to build the manufacturing plant to start with. So essentially, you're looking at upwards of 30% or more of the project costs being covered by the federal government for building the manufacturing facility for then, again, 30% of producing anything out of that manufacturing facility. And then also on the supply side, the demand for those components is 30% or more potentially tax credits for building the facilities. So the, the wind farms, the solar farms. And the interesting thing as well is it's moving to a technology neutral platform. So it's really saying, hey, whatever you have that is going to reduce carbon, it's, it's, if you have a, a zero carbon energy uh, solution, then that will be able to get the tax credits. So it goes across the board. Increase the tax credits for energy efficiency. So commercial energy efficiency projects previously were about $1.80 a watt uh, that you could get for various tax credits, uh, depending on the amount of energy that you would reduce. That is going up to $5 or more, more than doubling the amount of energy efficiency credits that are available. And that's going to a lot of low income uh, activities as well. The the funding for the weatherization assistance program, where a lot of the low-income you know, weatherization funding goes, that's been quadrupled uh, with this funding. So when we look at you know, the workforce, it's all across the board. In all of these technologies to meet those demands, we're going to need a lot more workers. That is coming up as, as the number one issue, uh, potentially next to supply chain, although that's uh, you know, getting the components in, in the first place. The next challenge to getting these projects built is having the workers to put them in place. Yeah, I think that's really good framing, right? The, the two limiting factors that everybody's talking about are supply chain and workforce. So maybe we'll just jump right in. You know, when you th we think about, I mean, you just identified a very broad sector of the American economy from construction and manufacturing to production and air sealing and electric vehicles and all kinds of things that now have tax incentives. And that's not even to mention, I mean, maybe just go through some of the, the, the level of funding that will also come through states through the Environmental and Climate Justice Block Grants. There's $3 billion for that. Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, another $27 billion. DOE Loan Program Office, $40 billion that will come through in some form of stimulus. The Transmission projects, Department of Ag, REAP program increase. There's just the, you know layering on top of all of this tax incentive funding are a, a bunch of funds that will be likely administered through state offices. So thinking about you know that that broad stimulus, and again, as you mentioned, the largest climate bill ever to pass in in, in the U.S. What types of positions are you foreseeing will be in the highest demand? Definitely the 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 People involved with the construction phase of it is where there's we continue to see the, the highest demand for work. If you look at uh, Interstate Renewable Energy Council, IREC, we, ha we put out the solar job census every year, so you can get a good idea of the types of jobs available there. Uh, of course, manufacturing, we're going to see growth in manufacturing, but that's going to be you know very localized with where those plants are. You know, There's been a, a number of announcements uh, since the passage of the bill. Certainly, we'll see jobs in the manufacturing sector. Those are going to be localized. Where the you're going to see the need across the board is those installers. And, and 
a really critical piece of that is electricians as well. Electricians are going to be involved in a lot of these other apps, not just the solar installations, but also those EV chargers, the electrification uh, of homes and businesses. Certainly electricians and other laborers and mechanics who work in the field, installers, uh, for lack of a better word there. But to build those projects as well, you're going to need everybody else involved. You need the developers uh, people going out there securing the land, the people involved in the finance side of things and the technology. You know, we see a lot of growth even in, in software and providing tools to uh, streamline the process, uh, to acquire customers and to design projects. There's been a, a big growth in, in that area too. So it's really across the board, but the, the, the largest number of people needed are going to be on in the, the installation side. And that, that applies to energy efficiency as well. HVAC technicians, again, electricians to do the electrification with heat pumps, induction stoves, and, and other tools like that that are coming. Huge, huge need for uh, people in the, in the skilled trades across the board. Well, this sounds, you know, like an all hands on deck moment. And I understand it facing a national electrician shortage before the bill passed. And, you know, we were seeing that on projects all across the country. And now we have this increased demand. So I guess I'll maybe we can dig in on the electrician side first. What should our priorities be? Or I guess I should say, what do you see out there that's that, that you feel is working or is a good model to pursue to, to ramp up the, the skilled labor trades? This is driven by the Inflation Reduction Act, too, as we haven't got to. A lot of the, these tax credits are tied to labor provisions. It's the first time that we've seen, at least at the federal level, these incentive fundings being tied to having a labor uh, requirement to it. And one of the, there's two key factors that labor require. One is that they have to be paid prevailing wages, so they need to be uh, paid a good, a good wage for that job. The other one, though, is apprenticeships, and there's a requirements to get almost all of those tax credits, uh, whether it's building that manufacturing facility or it's installing those uh, components. They need to, that work needs to be done, at least the, the construction portion of that work does need to be done by a registered apprentice, a certain percentage of it. It starts at 12.5% this year, goes up to 15% next year. So 15% of the labor is going to need to be involved in a registered apprenticeship program, and that is a job training program to train somebody in a particular occupation. So particularly as we look at those skilled trades, we look at those construction jobs, it is going to be you know, a large portion of those jobs are going to be through registered apprenticeships. Registered apprenticeship is a model where you learn on the job uh, under the supervision of a, a mentor, uh, somebody who knows the occupation well, very well, often called a journey person, uh, somebody that's gone through that training already. It is on the job training for typically multiple years. Uh, it has to be at least one year by, by requirement. Uh, by the regulations, but typically construction trades were anywhere from two to five years uh, worth of training on the job, supplemented by related classroom instruction. Uh, so these uh, trade programs are well established uh, across these different occupations of uh, particularly electrician. If you want to learn how to be an electrician, typically that's done through an apprenticeship. There are there are other ways, but uh, that is one of the most well established and uh, you know, ways to do so. And that requires the employers to be training through a structured process for several years uh, on the job. And that is how you create an electrician. <laughs> that, that, that's how you, you learn the, the, the occupation is uh, on the job training, a supervision of a mentor for, for several years to learn the different parts of that, uh, you know, what that person does, supplemented with some, some you know, classroom instruction as well related to that where you learn the, the codes and safety and other, other aspects. Well, let's dig in on the apprenticeship side a little bit because, as we know, the, and as you mentioned, the, the provisions drive apprenticeship hiring to, to receive the tax credits. Where do typically apprenticeships are licensed through the Department of Labor or through a state licensing body? But where do people usually enter into a, an apprenticeship program or get their training? Is it at a technical college, a training center? How, how, how are apprenticeships, how, how does someone find an apprenticeship and get the training for that? Well, an apprenticeship is a job with an employer. So often it's, it's directly through that employer. They're going to be hiring for the apprentice. Whether that apprenticeship is in coordination with a college or other training program like that, it could be a labor union that would be the employer. There, there does need, you know, it is a paid job. So uh, you always have to have an employer involved. 
and, and often it's just directly through the uh, employer who is going to be hiring that apprentice. And that, that employer is then who is responsible for all the on-the-job training, whether that's, again, through a, uh, an organized uh, labor you know, trade union where that person may go work for different employers on contract or different contractors uh, to do projects, but they're, they're part of that labor union, or whether it's directly with an employer who has uh, registered their own program. So there's different, different people can sponsor a program. A, a college can certainly be a sponsor of a program too. Often the, the training, you know, somebody's looking for training, they would go to a college and uh, get that related instruction. But to be an apprenticeship program, you have to have that employment there as well. They have to be, you know, the bulk of that training is learned on the job under the supervision of a mentor uh, in a work environment. So. so what are some of the benefits to an employer of being part of an apprenticeship program and hiring apprenticeships and participating in some apprenticeship board or labor union? Apprenticeships are really driven by the industry. The workforce needs of a particular business uh, or industry in general is what drives uh, apprenticeships. So the, the benefits uh, for the employer are they are the ones doing the training. So they're the, the bulk of the training, uh, that certainly all the on-the-job training. So they know what the person is learning. There's been you know, some criticism by employers over the years of the sometimes the training programs uh, don't given by other educational institutions or organizations. Sometimes they're not as well aligned with what the employer uh, is looking for uh, to, for that person to learn. So in this instance, uh, you know, that training is very much driven by the employer in terms of what uh, they're going to do it, how and when they're going to do it. Other benefits, it, attraction of diverse candidates. So as a uh, earn while you learn model, there's not a need to go into debt for multiple years to earn a college degree. So it can attract people that don't have the, the, where, the means to be able to get a college education and attract the diverse candidates that way. There is uh, lots of uh, studies on the retention. So uh, and that is a, you know, a, a challenge that employers face is being able to retain those employees once they get them. So the employee sees the commitment that the employer has provided to, to that training, to that job pro progression and growth, uh, to that career pathway. So that employee sees the investment that the employer is making in them. They're therefore more committed to that employer. You know, so lower turnover, certainly increased safety uh, with the training that's required, having a, a a, a better safety record is always good for for employers. And during while they're learning, they can they can pay them less as well. There's a, a the other component of apprenticeship, which you haven't mentioned, is that as they progress through the program, then get progressively higher wages. But as they start off, it's a recognition that they're they're learning, and therefore the pay rates are lower during those first you know during the apprenticeship overall than they would be paying somebody who is a skilled employee. So it's a way to develop that person, make sure they have the skills that you want them to have and keep them uh, and committed to you and your business. So in some ways, the apprenticeship at principal is tied to the employer and that helps with retention because that employee is getting the benefit of the education and training and, uh, and pursuing that apprenticeship or that licensure as they, as they work. But then once they complete the apprenticeship, then they have this credential that they're you know, that they have with them as a professional credential and increases their wages and makes them, I guess, very employable. I mean, who, who doesn't want to employ an electrician nowadays, I guess? <laughs> Everybody's needed electricians. It, it, it's honestly, it shocked me how few solar companies uh, over the years have uh, worked to actually develop the electricians in-house uh, through an apprenticeship pr program versus buying them, essentially, you know, it, it, from somebody else have, having been given that training. It, it becomes harder to attract that person that's gotten that training from somewhere else. They're going to be committed to that company that, that supported them through that process. Are, are you uh, saying that this new these new apprenticeship provisions in the IRA, do you think that will change that disposition of the solar industry? Certainly is at the commercial, you know, the, the large scale, so utility scale. Uh, so the requirements uh, apply to projects that are one megawatt and above. So it's, it's predominantly the utility scale where you're seeing the requirement to get that. And what it is, is that the base tax credit is, is one fifth of what they would get if they didn't do apprenticeships and pay prevailing wage. So that you can get, for, for instance, the, the investment tax credit, they get 6% of the project cost paid for if they don't pay prevailing wages and hire apprentices for the project. They do, they get 30%. So literally almost a quarter of the project costs hinge on paying prevailing wage and 
uh, having registered apprenticeships. So the financial incentive is there for the employers to deliver that training to develop the workforce. So we see it uh, definitely you know, in the utility scale sector. That said, though, there's a huge workforce need and uh, apprenticeships are a way to build a workforce. And so uh, we certainly are seeing interest as well. There's, there's several examples of residential and commercial installers uh, that see this as a way to develop that workforce as well, particularly as you're talking about for those licensed occupations like an, uh, an electrician, where in order to get that license, you typically would have to go through an apprenticeship program. So we're seeing that going down also, even in the residential energy efficiency world, interest in, hey, we need a workforce. Okay, well, the way you build the workforce is train them on the job and, and, and through a, a structured program and an apprenticeship. It's a good workforce development tool uh, across the board whether the incentive's there or not. The incentives certainly help give the financial incentive to, to make it happen. But. Kind of framing what you said, you know, really there, there are two markets we're talking about. The, the large-scale market that, that surely has an apprenticeship driver with a tax credit for Megawatt Plus. But then we have this whole burgeoning meter-connected market that isn't just solar, but now there's energy storage and energy efficiency. So maybe just broadening the conversation a bit, both in kind of like the licensed apprenticeship context in, as far as occupations and just general hiring need, what other types of occupations and training are you seeing in high demand kind of in, in this broader kind of distributed generation space? Really, a lot of it falls around the laborer category. And the way the apprenticeships work is often there's a primary occupation that then can have specializations within there. You can modify the base occupation. The way they, there, there's some standardization that works in terms of they're all training towards one occupation. So there's essentially a core area of knowledge that needs to be learned, but then they're gonna be learning that in on the job with a particular employer that's gonna be working with certain type of technology and such. And that's, that's the way it's always worked with these programs. And then the related instruction helps to make sure that everybody's learned a lot of this, the same content. But the other occupations we see, when we look at these utility scale projects, it laborers uh, is a, a classification of you know an occupation. That's typically a two-year apprenticeship program, and across the board, somebody can help build any type of construction project. There's other, certainly, as we talked about electricians, there's the assembly of the, the, the racking material is either a carpenter slash pile driver, could be an iron worker, some of these other occupations like that. Those are the ones that are going to be meeting the requirements. The other one would be operating engineers, so somebody who operates the equipment, uh, operates and maintains the equipment potentially driver, truck driver, but that's more getting a little more specific there. But operating engineers, laborers, and electricians, that's the bulk of the, the labor that's going to be needed to do these projects, whether it's a solar project or a wind project or, or any other energy project. On the large-scale projects, these roles are often very tightly negotiated between the unions, right? So you'd have you know, and that's kind of what we see on projects is the role of the operating engineer begins and ends here and the, the, the pipe fitter begins and ends here and the electrician begins and ends here. How do you see that, that dynamic playing out or, or what are some of the considerations on a large scale work site for, for project developers as they're kind of pursuing workforce training or apprenticeship programs? That applies whether it's an in-house program or through a project labor agreement with a union or with a contractor that just uses union labor. There, there needs to be a differentiation of who does what, and that gets into the prevailing wages as well. So a certain task is performed by a certain type of person, and that does vary by locality. So in some places, especially as you start bringing in the labor unions, some of them we do see three labor union agreements where it's going to be primarily those, those three that we talked about, operating engineers, the uh, electricians and the laborers. In others, we see a five-party labor agreement where you may then bring in carpenter pile drivers and iron workers, other occupations that come in. Uh, but it is interesting because each of those, the laborers have their definition of what they are able to do. Theirs goes through the trade union, LIUNA. They have a, a job task analysis that says what a laborer does on a solar job. And it goes all the way through installing conduit and pulling wire. And the electricians think that as soon as you touch a wire, you know, and, uh, and often conduit as well. So that's the role of an electrician. Carpenters come in and, and you know, they have a job task analysis that says they're able to do uh, the bulk of that work as well. It needs to be negotiated. Sometimes it is done on a project-by-project project basis. Uh, often we'll, we'll see it in a, in a region 
of an area where the labor unions have sort of worked a couple of those out. They come to a standard operating procedure for the state or the region, uh, but you can even see it from county to county in some places. So it, it can get you know, in some places where it's say, well, and if you're in this county, this work has to be done by an electrician. But if you're out here in this area, then, uh, you know, the laborer can do uh, that piece of it, too. So it, it, it does get a little messy, um, but you need to you need to figure that out. Important part is that you're training that person for that occupation. It's going to be part of their job. They're going to learn how to do that and be able to do that on any project where they go. In some ways, it's a result of this being a relatively new industry, right? This is solar farm construction. And, and like you said, it's kind of the, the cards have fallen different ways in different places, but that's a precursor and a necessary precursor to building these projects and getting labor in place and, and establishing these workforce pipelines. So before we go into the roles of kind of training providers and high schools, maybe let's jump onto the meter connected stuff. And uh, even though there isn't necessarily a direct tax credit that applies to apprenticeships there, as you mentioned, there's kind of this broad, broader idea of like, well, apprenticeships valuable for creating a workforce pipeline and, and retaining employees. So when we think about this broader electrification, what are we thinking about for occupations and, and what are some of the highest demand occupations? Clearly, you're talking about elect electrification. It's primarily going to be electricians. When you're looking at putting in an electric vehicle charging station, it's a fairly, you know, it's a high high voltage, high amperage circuit. Uh, put in the system is relatively straightforward installation, but it is electrical work. Um, same with, you know, your induction stoves and all of that. That's that's going to be electric. Often these projects require electrical panel upgrades, so it's sort of rewiring of that whole electrical panel. That needs to be done typically by an electrician. That is the, the number one occupation we see the need for uh, as we look at all of those uh, electrification efforts and tied into that, the solar technologies, the battery uh, storage, that's all electric. Now, there are some states that have developed licenses specific to these emerging occupations, so uh, some states do have a solar installer license where that solar installer then is able to do all the electrical work associated with that installation. Uh, so we see that, well, California has had a solar installer license for decades, and they've been authorized to then be able to do that work. Florida is another example that has that. Uh, but many states say that this is electrical work and it needs to be done by an electrician. So it is state by state in that regard, but certainly electricians and then the laborers to help them with that. So often the electricians do not want to be climbing on the roof, do not want to be poking holes in that roof and uh, working up, up there and installing the racking and all of that material. So having a laborer or someone, uh, you know, and it's a solar installer to help with, you know, the roof work in particular, that is where we see oftentimes another laborer type person can come in and uh, assist that electrician in completing the job. So you've worked not only all over the country, but in a variety of different contexts at the, the technical college level, with industry, with vets. Or, so I guess, you know, this is a, this is a need. We, we need to attract people to, these, to this job, and we need to keep them in these jobs. And so I guess, you know, if you think about that from high schools to two-year colleges to joint apprenticeship programs to, to training vets to enter the workforce, what do you see as critical roles and what programs have you seen that, that you think are particularly effective and that we, we can learn from? We really need to get people interested in these technologies from the earliest grade. So there's a lot of great programs out there to introduce people to, to energy. We certainly see a growing interest by young people in having jobs that deal with the climate crisis, making sure that that's clear, that these pathways are available all the way back to, you know, elementary and middle school. So excellent programs, groups like Kid Win Project that introduce these technologies, have fun activities that teach science and concepts uh, through these new new technologies. There's a lot of great examples out there. So the NEED Project, National Energy Education Development, has a lot of great activities for, for young people. And then as we get into, you know, that career exploration, it's important for uh, us to look at that, make sure that these pathways are understood. So IREC does a lot of work with that, with our career maps. Those are useful for looking at the different options within green buildings or solar to explore when somebody is considering which education pathway they might go on. I think at, at all levels, we need to, from, from parents and guidance, guidance counselors, teachers, everybody needs to have 
uh, the respect for those trades as a viable pathway and that it is a great way to get a good job that's uh, going to be family sustaining and isn't going to come with you know massive debt from that education you'll start off with a good salary got a lot of potential for work for your whole career in these trades and you know the trades need need more respect uh, within our culture uh, broadly so everybody plays that role all the way up through the education system and making sure that those pathways are understood, uh, what those options are, as well as how they can help to address the issues that uh, youth are concerned about, you know, protecting our environment, addressing global warming. And uh, they can do that through, you know, wide variety of, of jobs, but, you know, a lot of those jobs are going to be in the trades. Kind of like the challenge of our time is that, you know, we're facing a workforce need, but we have areas all across the country with persistent high unemployment. And we have seen a number of studies in northern states. I'm specifically thinking of one in Milwaukee where if you look at the city of Milwaukee and you overlay like historically redlined areas where many non-white communities didn't have access to the credit and financing that makes life happen in this country, they not only have the highest levels of persistent unemployment and highest levels of incarceration, but the highest energy burdens and also the, the highest exposure to kind of pollutants in the environment related to fossil fuel production. And so the context really is here, you know, if we're going to remake the energy system and we're going to do it in a way that's more distributed and more clean, how do we distribute the benefits also? So I know you all work on those issues. We do. So what what can we do? What are some of the the strategies for kind of inclusion, getting getting more employment in the areas that need it most. Well, return to the IRA that does also have provisions uh, added, 10% adders for developing projects in uh, what are called these energy communities. So these communities that have been impacted in, in the ways that you've uh, just talked about there. So there is financial incentive for that through through IRA to make sure those projects are built there. Again, the apprenticeship programs as well. A requirement of apprenticeship program is it does have to be non-discriminatory in terms of its hiring practices for who is attracted. And as the programs uh, operate, they want to look at having diversity goals for those. And so those are going to be monitored and, and, and looked at there as well through those registered programs. But it, it you know, there's a lot of other opportunities for making sure the employers are hiring locally to meet those needs in those areas that are attracting diverse populations. And this is a, a way to connect into those educational institutions, connect into the nonprofit associations and other groups that are providing the assistance to these uh, people. Obviously, the, the workforce system as well, the, the U.S. workforce system uh, with career one-stops, shops uh, all over the country, our, our state workforce boards and lo uh, local workforce boards are a good place to connect with with those groups. There's tons of programs dedicated towards veterans, which in themselves are a very diverse uh, population. You know, a lot of interest in bringing veterans onto projects. They're mission driven. They, they know how to follow the instructions and get the projects done. They have leadership skills. They bring a lot of strong work ethic to labor that needs to be, be done. There's excellent programs for bringing people from, as you said, after incarceration, uh, to train them in these jobs, get them interested in them. There's programs for women, getting more women into the construction trades is, is, is very important. So there's a lot of uh, good programs uh, targeting that. I know MREA has done a lot in, in, in all of these areas as well. So first is getting them exposed and knowledgeable about the career opportunities. So providing those that those basic introductory, like, hey, here's, here's some, some options, then there may need to be some some skills that they need to get before they can enter in, into an apprenticeship program. So sometimes some of the basic math and things that they have to have before they can enter into an apprenticeship. So these pre-apprenticeship programs are really important. So one, it just gets them interested in the occupation, and two, it gets them that, some of those skills that they may need to then succeed in those programs or be, even be able to get into them. So lots of great examples out there to, to highlight in all of those areas to, to attract diverse candidates. It's really important to make sure that the energy transition is, is a just uh, transition that lifts everybody together and everybody can benefit. The other part of it is making sure those incentives are, are installed in those areas too. So having the programs that can address that. And some of the other provisions of IRA do have some like direct pay provisions. So now nonprofit entities can get the tax credits, whereas before, you know, a nonprofit is not paying the taxes. So 
They weren't able to get those tax credits. Now they can, and there's the financing and other things like that available as well through that. We want to make sure that all of the opportunities are there for everyone, both on the workforce side, but also on the deployment and the benefits of those projects, both economically and, and environmentally. Maybe the context today is that with the recently passed federal legislation that includes a significant funding stream that's about to hit states, that maybe what we have is the opportunity, the incentives are in place, but what we need is the inspiration and the will to really bring this to life. And as you said, making it real on the ground is, is a good way to start where people see the benefits and experience it themselves. And uh, But we also need the employer will, and we need to, to leverage all of the programs you mentioned to, to build these pipelines. So I'm going to Shoot it back to you for one last question here. It might be a hard one. Maybe it's an easy one. So you sit there, Interstate Renewable Energy Council. You're, you have, you're part of it with us. You realize that you have some impact over one of the biggest limiting factors uh, for us to transition to a clean energy system here, which is workforce. So I'm giving you right now a magic wand. You have a magic wand. You can wave it. What are you doing with it? What? How are you solving this problem? What? What don't we have that we need? The critical piece is to inspire people for these jobs, to make them aware of the opportunities that are out there to make an impact. And that's whether it's on the construction trades or other occupations in, in finance and in technology, in manufacturing, all across the board. It's realizing the opportunities that are there. And so recognizing that there is a pathway into these careers and that what really whatever you want to do with your life, you can apply it towards this problem, this energy transition and, and, and addressing the climate change. If you, if you like finance and dealing with numbers and big business, you can apply that to solving these problems. If you're into science and, and technology and research and development, uh, there's tons of opportunities there to develop new products and, and new solutions to address this. And if you, you just want to have a, a job and go back to your family at the end of the day, but you know, do a hard day's work you know, in, a, in a construction trade, you can also have an impact by applying that to the, the clean energy industry. Feel good about what you're doing. My magic wand would be, would be that inspiration to know that whatever path you want to go, you can apply that to this important industry. Such a great opportunity. I wonder if it's not too late for me to become an electrician, <laughs> Richard. You got me inspired. I Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Is there anything else you'd like to, to leave us with today when it comes to workforce issues? Anything we didn't talk about or, or, or anything else from, from uh, your position? I did want to thank yeah, MREA and what you're doing as well and don't want to leave, leave that out because that is part of that, introducing people to these jobs, getting them the skills they need through those, that training that you do, great work, and the certifications that you train to. Because we talked a lot about apprenticeship training, but you worked at the North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners. We align our training with that. We train over 600 people a year. Many people pursue that certification. What is the value in this transition of a certification like NABCEP certification? It shows that you know how to, you know, that particular technology or job that you're, shows that you have that skill. Whether you're an electrician or a carpenter or a regular construction laborer, getting those additional certifications aligned with you know, the industry to show your competence there, to learn that, that field. So you can, you, know, you can apply an electrician, all different types of technology. One that has a NABCEP certification, you, you know that they know how to do uh, the solar component. Sales, you know, that's another, actually, we, we, we've left out that, that role. That's the other big role that people are hiring for all the time too, is on the sales side. So we got to get these projects developed and sold. And one last piece is instructors, <laughs> is people to train them is a, is a critical shortage too, especially as all of these people now have to have these registered programs. That is putting a huge need on people to be able to train this workforce too. We need those experts to get involved in programs like yours, become instructors and in training, inspire that next generation, get them to know the, the paths that are out there and, and help them navigate those options based on their interests and skills. There's a lot of work for everybody at all, at all levels of interest. Whatever you want to, want to do, you can apply it to this field. And, and we know uh, MREA has been there to help and uh, thank you again, for all of the work that you do. Let's unpack it just a little bit. I think there's some, probably some benefit of talking about like the role of NABCEP and other certifications, because as you mentioned, you know, when it comes to 
designing, installing, operating, maintaining, selling solar PV, there's no apprenticeship occupation for that. There's an apprenticeship occupation for electrician or residential wireman or construction craft laborer or customer service professional. And so much of the industry has developed through this independent third-party certification called NABCEP, and it has been the gold standard. And most solar PV systems have been designed and installed by professionals that hold that certification. Now, that is likely changing over the next 10 years, or at least, you know, there, there will be more of that focus. But can you talk a little bit, especially I feel like in the, in this distributed side, you have like BPI certification and energy auditor certification. Do you see enduring values to those? They have driven the industry. So here we sit with all of these different certified professionals out there doing energy audits, designing PV systems, and now incentives with apprenticeship. So where do you kind of see this market going? Do you see a con- enduring value for these these continued like certification programs? Whether they're integrated into an apprentice, you know, a broader apprenticeship program and shows that you have that specialized knowledge in this field, or whether it's a way to just demonstrate that knowledge for that particular job. Certifications are a way to validate that knowledge and skills and experience that someone has. So I, I think they're always going to be an important part of the workforce development system. You, you see this in any occupation. So you, you go into nursing, right, or, so, or something like that. Uh, you have your general sort of nursing degree, but then you get specialized certifications in particular type of field of practice there or particular technologies that you might be working on in that that practice. You'd have the same in in other types of of industries too. Information technology, right? You might have a, a general computer science degree or you might just sort of get into a job, but then you get particular certifications in particular types of software or uh, networking solutions or things like that, right? You see it across the board, all different industries will continue to see that grow here in the clean energy industry as new technologies come about. You know, there's new certifications. Uh, I know the MREA actually just worked on with NABCEP uh, on energy storage. So as those new technologies come about, there will be specialized training that's needed to learn those. You know, often certifications are the way that you then validate uh, the knowledge in that. So I think we'll continue to see that evolve and be an integral part, whether that's through a, an occupational trade program like an apprenticeship or whether it's a specialized, you know, more job training uh, program where you're like, hey, we need a bunch of workers to do this particular task. And that, you know, if you have this certification, that's what we need. We'll see. We'll continue to see both those happen. That's been our experience, of course, you know, like the benefit of a certification and, you know, any licensure, electrical licensure is the need for continuing education. And for us, the provision of, you know, the industry has evolved. It, it has evolved so fast and will continue to evolve fast with new products, new techniques, new innovations, new codes and requirements uh, that all have to be met. And that all through a certification, you know, we deliver that to make sure that NABCEP certified professional can continue to access the information that they need and maintain their certification. And we surely have, you know, our instructors, most of our all of our instructors are licensed electricians, <laughs> master electricians, and they stick with the NABCEP certification because it's where all the action is in the in the solar PV world. That's where they can connect with all of the latest and, and greatest. So, you know, we definitely see that. Let's switch. Another thing before we let you go is to talk about instructors. I appreciate you bringing that up because I was just in a conversation with someone from the incumbent utility and they're like, oh, they kept talking about the gray wave, right? This like all these gray haired utility folks resigning. I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, I see you too, Richard. You got a little, <laughs> you're not quite at the gray wave stage. Maybe you're like at the, like the gray ripple stage, <laughs> but not quite yet, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but where are we going to get these instructors from? Are they are they going to be professionals that are like close to retiring, or like how are we going to develop this next generation of and trainers to train this this new generation of workers? That is a good question. Training institutions are going to need to bring those people in, but also, as you said, especially through an apprenticeship program, the the trainers are going to be the people that are out there that that have that experience, uh, you know, of working in the industry for you know at least a few years, um, and and know what they're doing, right? But it's important then to make sure that they're that they also have that uh, educational knowledge. Uh, how do how do you teach? 
properly. How do you structure a training program and, and, and meet your learning objectives and track performance of, of students and, and things like that? The curriculum development that's around that. We're going to have to take a lot of people who are experienced and, and make sure that they know that you know, one, plug them into these systems, have a good curriculum that they can use. That's a key piece, that standardized curriculum. That, so those, those tools, so they don't have to do a lot of that work. So as much as can be done through certification programs that say, hey, here's the tasks that you need to teach. So having those tools that put, present that in a curriculum that they can then use easily and the structure in place of saying, okay, well, this is what has to be done. You have to, again, through an apprenticeship program says you need to spend X number of hours in these types of concepts and they need to have these classes taught to them that are going to teach these things as well. So all of those tools uh, certainly help, that tool and structure. It's going to be tough. <laughs> There's a lot of, you know, we need, we need people doing the work in the field, and it does take time out of that to, to do the training. But that's how you develop the, you know, the workforce of the future. Yeah, we need to invest that time need to have employers who are willing to, to then pay people to do the instruction rather than be out in the field as well. Your community college is going to struggle to find qualified people to teach these classes when they're all too busy working in the field. So it's recognition on the part of the industry as well that we need to dedicate some people towards building that, that future workforce. And it's hard when there's such a, a huge demand for being out there doing the actual work to make sure that you can carve out that time. But that's how it's, that's how it's done. People need experience. They need that education, that training first. And then we need to be able to say, all right, hey, I, I need to give something back. You know, everybody that, that is experienced, you need to recognize, hey, I need to, to pass on this knowledge, need to be able to bring two, three, four m more me's on <laughs> to do, you know, grow the workforce. It's a cost, obviously, to the employer to, to dedicate that time uh, for some of those more experienced people. But we're going to have to do whether they're teaching in a community college in the evening and night or they're training an apprenticeship on the job and spending some of their time making sure they know what they're doing. You know, the workforce of today is who's largely going to be those trainers uh, one way or another. Well, I guess in summary, we need it all. We need entry-level programs that inspire people into the field. We need certification programs that keep people plugged into the specific aspects that they really want to focus on we need licensure and apprenticeship programs to grow electricians and craft laborers. We need salespeople. We need finance people. We need, well, 9 million people is what we need. <laughs> yeah. And we need to recruit from the places that have the, the, the highest un, un, and persistent unemployment needs. So I think maybe we should get back to work, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got a lot of work to do, Richard. We do, and uh, hopefully we're inspiring some people with this here today. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I look forward to working with you more. We would like to take a moment to thank the 2023 Energy Fair Coffee and Cafe sponsor, Ruby Coffee Roasters. Ruby is guided by the notion that responsible business can do good and create value for everyone involved. Each of Ruby's coffees are carefully and specifically chosen to represent a glimpse of a microclimate, microregion, and vignette into a moment in time. To learn more about Ruby, their locations, and monthly subscription options, visit rubycoffeeroasters.com. The Rise Up Podcast, Season 4, Episode 9, Workforce Readiness. Special thanks to our guest, Richard Lawrence, hosted by Nick Hyla and produced by Kyle Galloway. Made possible with support from the Sally Mead Hands Foundation.